So before I start, I'll, I'll just ask you uh, maybe just a couple things about the material okay. you provided the class. I don't think everybody's had a chance to go through it, but uh, I've okay. sort of made some mental notes myself. Okay. Uh, it's really interesting to me how you pose the end of the Viking Age, sort of. You don't really address it in the article, but you do sort of point it out and you call, and I think you also reference Armin in this respect of Harold being this Viking ruler. And yeah. we were discussing last class sort of about the end of the Viking Age and questioning when the Viking Age would be um, from different perspectives. And it's sort of interesting to note that um, you've sort of taken the perspective of Harold there being the Viking and um, his death being the end of the Viking Age. You point to that. Um, you don't really specifically say that you believe that that's the end of the Viking Age, but you, you don't dismiss it either. So I'm wondering what your perspective there is. Well, it's a, it's a popular uh, conception in the English-speaking world that the Viking Age ends with uh, the firstly with the Battle of Stamford Bridge and then with the Norman invasion. But of course, you know, there is there are no it's a fluid uh, transition, and uh, it it sort of assumes it takes us for granted that there is such a thing as a Viking Age because. Uh, now it's customary to talk about the early Viking Age and late Viking Age, which is qualitative, qualitatively different, because then we have these Scandinavian kingdoms and these invasions of England, which are actually kings doing it, who are ruling states. So the Scandinavian uh, countries are becoming sort of uh, kingdoms that are, have their rulers. So that, that's the difference between the early Viking Age, where you don't really have these state entities. You have uh, ar armies that are put together for the purpose of invading, and also petty kings, which rule maybe in a single town or so. But it's it's very different from the late Viking Age. And also, Harald is, of course, a modern figure as well. He He... He mints coins, for example. He uses foreign examples like Byzantine examples. And this is also true for the Danish king. So there is a huge difference between these kings and the and the, the earlier Viking, uh, what, whatever you call them, really. But, That's um, a great answer to my question. I'm gonna stop you there because I don't want you to get too far into the main material. Um, yeah. so, so we are at past 11.30, so I'll just do a small introduction for you. Yeah. And I hope I, some of those points that you're making were some that I hope had, would come up. So um, yeah. I'm really excited to hear what else you have to say. Um, so just as a general introduction, Sveder Jakobsen has joined us today to have a discussion about Harold the Hard Ruler or Harald Rally, in English, Hard Rather, sometimes. Uh, spelled or also sometimes translated as the severe among others. Mm -hmm. uh, Sverdard is a pro professor in medieval history at the University of Iceland in the Faculty of Philosophy, History and Archaeology. Um, and I would also like to point out he is my doctoral supervisor. Uh, Sverdard um, has a research output that is very extensive with many articles, book chapters and monographs probably numbering well over 100 according to research portals and lists of his published material. He specializes in early Icelandic history, historical writings, and the Scandinavian connections to the East, such as the Byzantine Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire, as some people might prefer to call it. The article to which he pointed this class in the lead up to this, this discussion is called Arotis, the evolution of a Varangian stereotype. Arotis is another name for Harold Dirk, coming from the Greek manual oration of admonition for the emperor, composed between 1075 and 78, and related to military and public concerns of the Byzantine emperor. So I decided it would be good to give him yet another name and epithet, Aratis the Varangian, or mm -hmm. I think I heard um, in Iceland recently even for the, the, the pronunciation Varangian. 
We're into it. Yeah, I think I even heard you say it. Okay. Kind of talk. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, which one is it? Can we do both? Uh, I don't really know. You know that that's not my specialty, really. Uh, <laughs> but when you're speaking to an English audience, I felt you were you were apt to to go with what others were saying. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so. It's, just to finish off here, Sander would like to discuss with us today his most renowned Varangian or Varangian of Norway. Arlteis the Varangian became king of Norway and led him to die in an unsuccessful campaign to seize the throne of England in the fabled year 1066. Mm -hmm. This event in this year have often been marked as the end of the Viking Age, but as we learn in this course, things are not as simple as this. Perhaps Sander can aid us today and shed further light on the Eastern connections of Scandinavian people during the Middle Ages and the end of the Viking Age. Sverre, welcome, and please, the floor is yours now. Yeah, uh, I would just like to explain that this article and many of my writings are uh, part of a larger research project uh, uh, into the Eastern Vikings. And, and I'm trying to kind of uh, create a new, uh, a new type of context for the, Eastern Vikings, because I felt that the study of the Eastern Viking had been in a kind of rut for a long time, uh, and sort of kind of too, too devoted to creating a composite picture from many different types of sources. And the idea between the project is one of the folk, one of the most important points of the study has been to examine. Uh, the differences between, for example, uh, other types of Eastern Vikings, such as the Rus, but also uh, the Varantians, when, when and when they develop. So, so uh, I chose the article on Araltes because it is devoted to two types of discourse on the Eastern Vikings, one of which is uh, the contemporary debate like in uh, the Greek uh, oration of admonition to the emperor, but also Latin sources such as the history of the bishops, archbishops of Hamburg, uh, uh, Bremen, by Adam of Bremen. So these are the kinds of uh, sources that are typical of the contemporary debate on the Eastern Vikings, but then we have the development of cultural memory, which is... Uh, where I choose the family saga, so the Eastern Nikos over as a, an example. But of course, uh, that image has earlier roots, for example, in the King's sagas. So, so uh, really, this article is a type, it demonstrates two types of discourse on the Eastern Vikings. And uh, also, Harald is an, Araltes is an interesting person to study because he appears in many types of narratives, unlike most other people who are involved in the history of the Eastern Vikings, he, uh, we have different types of images of Araltes. And uh, just to point out the opposite, for example, the Rus who attacked Constantinople in 860 and are uh, mentioned in the orations of Patriarch Photios, and also in, in East Roman narrative histories, we have no uh, conflicting pictures from any other types of source. Also, the Rus mentioned by Ibn Padlan in the early 10th century, this is really a singular source. It only depicts the Rus at a certain stage in the development, but then no more. So, so in that context, uh, using Haraldur as an example is quite interesting. So, uh, and Haraldur is really an illustration of uh, a change in the discourse on the Eastern Vikings, who are from the middle of the 9th century and up to the middle of the 11th century, they're usually portrayed as Rus. And in Byzantine, some Byzantine historians of the 11th century, they still use the term Rus for all Scandinavians. Uh, they can also use, and they sometimes use sort of ancient terms like Scythians or so on, uh, Taurus Scythians, uh, if we take Cellos as an example. Uh, 
which is perhaps the best known Byzantine historian of the 11th century. But uh, then at the end of the 11th century, we have really a new type of Eastern Viking, which is the Varantian, who must be somewhat different from the Rus. And actually the example of Harald is one of the earliest instances in which uh, Eastern Viking is called by this term, a Varantian. So uh, one of my uh, objects of study has been to examine what was a Varantian. How, why are the Varantians different from the Rus? And this seems to be connected to state formation about uh, uh, state formation among the Rus. That is to say, the very rudimentary uh, kingdoms of the Rus are forming into uh, becoming more coherent states. And thus, an Eastern Viking that is called Rus must belong to that state often known as Kievan Rus, because uh, Kiev was the biggest city of the Rus, and, and maybe the one of the cities that was closest to Constantinople. And in the early 11th century, we have a very famous ruler of the Rus, who's called Yaroslav, who is very much connected to Scandinavian kings. He's married to a, a daughter of a Swedish king, uh, and uh, according to a late tradition when uh, no no uh, uh, you a late tradition when King Olaf was chased away from Norway he actually went to the Rus and his son was uh, spent some time there. This is not really mentioned uh, quite explicitly in uh, Adam of Bremen's account, although although it's said that Olaf went to the east, but Yaroslav is not mentioned in 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 that uh, connection. But anyway, uh, they were actually married to sisters, according to some sources. So it's very natural that Yaroslav and Olaf should have been allies. And then we have this single mention in Atom of Bremen in an insurgent called uh, Skolion that uh, Harald was actually the son-in-law of Yaroslav. He was uh, married to the princess Elizabeth, probably after his stay in Byzantium. And uh, this is not mentioned in Byzantine sources. There, Harald is one, actually one of the earliest instances in which an Eastern Viking is something else than the Rus. And uh, in this instance, uh, Harald is said to come from a county called Varankia. And he is the king of Varankia, or brother of the king of Varankia. And then he succeeds his brother. But of course, there are more more Varankians, and they cannot always be Norwegian. So uh, I have postulated that Varankia is some type of Scandinavian kingdom, according to the uh, Romans, uh, East Romans, and uh, Norway could be such a kingdom. So my argument is basically that Varankian is an ethnonym. It's not a type of warrior, but it's a type of... My, the argument is that... Uh, Varankian in Byzantine sources seem to be kind of an ethnic identity. They are listed among the Rus as a type of people uh, coming from Scandinavia. And the, probably this is to differentiate them from other Eastern Vikings, such as those coming from the Rus. Uh, and this is actually goes against the traditional picture of the Varankians, in which they are associated with uh, a military unit in the Byzantine army called the Varankian Guard. But in this early, there is no Varankian Guard. They are just, they are just Varankian serving in the Byzantine army. And uh, the tradition of, of Scandinavian serving in the Byzantine army is actually quite old. It already occurs in the early 10th century. But of course, these uh, people are called the Rus not Varankians. But uh, so if you want to say when did the, was the Varankian element of the army founded, that is, that's kind of a wrong question. The question is really when do the Romans start regarding some Eastern Viking as Varankians rather than Rus. And this ha seems to be the case at least at the, in the late 11th century. And uh, of course, uh, later on, uh, some of the Scandinavians are concentrated in kind of a 
a life card, and that then you can legitimately, legitimately, legitimately speak of the Valencian card, but that occurs quite later. And uh, Varankians were never constricted to one uh, type of military unit in the Roman army. So uh, with the arrival of Harald in Byzantium, a connection is established between uh, Norway and the Roman Empire, which continues throughout the 12th century, uh, through the age of the Crusades. So this is important because there seems to be a continuity rather than a shift between the late Viking Age and the Age of the Crusades is that Norwegian kings or people from this area they were some to come part of the Crusades along with the Emperor. So, and we have an, uh, in a contemporary saga called Sverre Saga from the late 12th century, we have this history of the Emperor uh, asking for military assistance from the Scandinavian kingdoms uh, because of this uh, ancient tradition. Uh, did you lose me now? Uh, no, you you Are did have a problem again. Um, just after you were yeah. saying um, about the, I, I I was assuming that you were going to get to a connection between the the role of the Byzantine Emperor before and after the or around the Crusades. The connection. Yeah, there is a connection there. Uh, that is to say, the visits of Norwegian dignitaries and kings like the Earl of Orkney they continue. So there is a continuity between Harald serving in the Byzantine army and this relationship which seems to exist between Norwegians and the Roman Emperor and perhaps all the Scandinavian kingdoms and the Roman Emperor. So it is from this uh, long-standing tradition which goes on from the middle of the 11th century until around 1200 that uh, these Scandinavians serving in the Roman army start to enter the narratives known as sagas, like King Sagas, early 13th century King Sagas, and also the family sagas. And in the art, uh, article argue that there is a connection, that is to say, in the King Saga Morkinskina, which is from the early 13th century, the term Varantian or Vairingi is introduced as it as a novelty, but uh, it's associated with King Harald. And then in the later family sagas, uh, the known Varantians are usually have some connection to Harald and the Icelanders who served Harald originally. And the most famous example is in Laxdala saga, the Botli Botlason episode. And he is actually a kinsman to people that were known to have served in with King Harald and visited Byzantium with him. So that's that's kind of, there is a, this established tradition about the Varantians in Iceland. So, so here I'm crossing from contemporary views of Harald into the realm of cultural memory, where there is kind of a literary topos about Varantians, but it is associated with the very positive image the Byzantine Empire had in old, at least West Norse sources in the 12th and 13th centuries and even later on. You really point to a particular um, sort of physical evidence too, though, with the coinage yeah. Yeah. that how they're introduced. Yeah, uh, the idea was to use many types of sources. And in my mind, they all corroborate each other. That is to say, the, the types of coin, the imitations of Byzantine coins uh, in Norway and Denmark from the late 11th century, they are mu much more than just imitations of design. They're also imitating economic thinking. And this is especially true for Norway, where King Harald seems to have debased the currency, which hardly anyone did at this time except the Byzantine emperor. And it is actually... The Byzantine emperor associated with Harald, Constantine Monomachus, who, who did this. So, so he seems to be uh, sort of, ha, ha, he seems to have uh, 
familiarized himself with the uh, Byzantine economic thought, which is quite modern for it for the time. So the idea is basically to be able to pay more money when you don't have it. <laughs> As is the idea between uh, devaluation in general. Right. So does that coincide with not using silver as a weight, rather as currency as, as a monetary unit? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. <clears throat> of course, these are the first kings, Scandinavian kings, actually to mint their own coins. This is quite a new practice in Scandinavia at the time. And, and uh, uh, in the early 11th century, they basically mostly used Anglo-Saxon coins, for example. And from what I understand, I did a little project where I talked to uh, somebody at Sedlabanki Islands. The um, I forget his name, uh, but he was he he did the gold verifier for he did the yep. analysis of it. I can't, yep. I can't think of his name, um, but uh, his opinion was that um, Icelanders never trusted a devalued system at at this stage. Uh, Iceland was not really a monetary economy at this stage. No. So we have to differentiate between the Norwegian kingdom, which had towns and trade, and Iceland, which is basically a peasant economy at the time. So so what the Icelanders would bring back from Byzantium are tokens, like a nice word or, or, or something, like nice cloth, for example. And this is not only things that were nice to look at, but this is actually symbolic currency because it's a token that these people had served the Byzantine emperor. Right, and that comes into the later narratives too, like, uh, is it Lockstyle where Botley comes back with this wonderful garb and everybody can't take their eyes off of him? Yeah, yeah, and, and he has also this old sword called Footbiter. He has gilded it. And this is actually has a parallel in the contemporary sagas because there was a sword called Mailbiter that is mentioned in contemporary sagas, which was from Byzantine. That's to say, an Icelander serving in the Byzantine army had brought it back, and then the chiefs are or the lords are trying to seize it from each other. So it's a sword of, of great symbolic value, I would say. Yeah, it was a, a prestigious thing to have served. Yeah, yeah, very prestigious. And this is clear, but we don't know how old this idea is. Uh, it, it's very apparent in the early 13th century, and maybe throughout the 12th century. I'm thinking of Orkney and Kesaya and Earl Rackwald. Uh, the motivation for his crusade seems to be to become gain more honor, and especially in connection with the Byzantine emperor. And this is really Emperor Manuel the first, Manuel Komnenos, whom the Icelanders knew very well, and Norwegians. And he, a lot of people went to visit him. For exam example, the Earl Rackwald, but also Earl Erling Skakke, who later became de facto ruler of Norway. The wife of Erling Skakke also visited uh, Byzantium on a separate occasion. That's to say she went there with another man. Uh, but both these people visited the Constantinople at one time or another. It's so, interesting that they used both Byzantium and Rome in the same works, too, as providing prestige. And maybe yeah, even with Markin's Skinner, you could say Jerusalem as well, with the same with the Jerusalem yeah. there. And I think, but I think uh, Byzantium was unique because it was a great secular power. So while they appreciated the relics and the sanctity of both Rome and Jerusalem, the only kind of secular honor you, that could be sought was in Constantinople, or the main secular honor. And this okay. is actually quite apparent already in, in the Skaldic poetry. And I'm, I'm thinking of early 12th century poems such as Erik Straupa about the Danish king who traveled to the Holy Land. And it seems clear that the greatest sign of his honor was going to Byzantium and being received by the emperor. Okay, I see what you mean by secular versus religious, because yeah. when they go to Rome, they're visiting the pontiff, the pope, yeah. versus an emperor. 
it's a different kind of pilgrimage, you could say. Although there were also relics and holy churches that, in Constantinople, there is there is even more there. And also, it seems uh, if you look at the very sort of uh, fragmentary Scandinavian evidence about Harald traveling to Constantinople, it's clear that the main theme is the wealth that he came back with. And this seems to be a very important uh, part of the stories about Harald, that he had great, gained great wealth. There. And you do sort of get into the sort of literary element, the, the fabulous elements, maybe, um, yeah. in relating it later to, and the culmination of all of these sort of motifs coming together in Greta saga specifically. Yeah, yeah, that's true, because uh, already in the early 13th century, this uh, the saga of Harald is becoming romanticized. And one of the key elements is his fighting a, a great beast in the dungeon of Constantinople. And the narratives do not agree what was his crime, what had he done to be placed in the dungeon, and they don't de even agree on wh what kind of beast he was fighting. But what is clear that he he was supposed to be fighting some kind of fierce beast and winning. And uh, so th this is a a, a quite old uh, narrative topos relating to Harold, but also that he was saved by a a lady, noble lady, and that's an element that's repeated in Gratisaga. And you must be aware in these family sagas that, that all the Varankian tales are established, more or less established literary motifs. So so you cannot say these are things that are actually happening. For example, Gratisaga is composed perhaps around 1400, that's to say more than three centuries after the event. So it's basically just a collection of literary uh, sort of uh, episodes which is put together very skillfully, you could say. Yeah, and the trick of Harald is very important in Gretesa as the trickster because uh, Thorstein Drome the tricks his opponent and it's, uh, Harald acts as an advisor. So this is an established literary picture of Harald that we can hear there. there. Yeah, I think there's something historical you can draw from that, though, right? That yeah. they they did this skillfully because they were so interested in having that sort of look of prestige for their ancestors. Yeah, and, and clearly, I think the Varankians are kind of uh, a type of Christian knight. Before the time of the Crusaders and the Templars, we have the Valencians, and they had fought in the service of a Christian empire. So they are kind of different. They are the antithesis of the Viking. Because Viking is only fighting for his private gain. In the family sagas, most Viking episodes are actually Vikings fighting other Vikings, sort of stealing their treasure and so on. There's not much emphasis on sort of plant, the plundering of the civilian population. But uh, the Valencians, they are actually fighting for a noble cause. They're fighting against heathens. They're fighting for the Christian empire. So this is a very attractive stereotype, you could say. Fair, yeah. And, and one that they appreciated, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and this, is, this is connected to the image of Byzantium in Iceland. That it's perceived as the most important Christian state and it, of course, it is the Roman Empire still existing, so it has this glorious past and also kind of glorious present in the wealth that's still concentrated there in the 11th and 12th centuries. It's before the sacking of Constantinople in, in 1204. All right. Um, I think I've exhausted all of my questions and my, my points that I was thinking of. In the I'd love to hear from your students if you if they have any questions. Yeah, I'd like to too. And anybody in the audience, anybody have something? I would wonder, in terms of the Varangians that were fighting for the Christian Empire, would they consider themselves to be Christian? Like, how much of a cultural identity did they still have with Scandinavia? Well, the implication seems to be in the sagas that they have adopted Christianity. So they are Christians even before the Christianization of Iceland, although many of the narratives actually take place 
shortly after the Christianization. So, but they are not really fighting for a secular cause anymore. They are fighting for uh, a more just cause. So one can see it. There's a lot of crusading ideology there. That there is, uh, there is this idea of fighting for a just, a just war for a just cause, and also they are also usually portrayed as defending. They are not attacking anyone. They are defending the empire. So that's an other important element in the descriptions. And, mm -hmm. and uh, there are many types of. There are a, a few types of of sort of literary Varangians. One is the pe person who has to be eliminated from the narrative and goes abroad and has a good ending. You know, like uh, uh, one of the most famous examples is the brother of of Gunnar in Yalsa, Kolskekur, who is kind of redundant to the story after his brother is killed, and then he goes to Byzantium and becomes a Varangian. So this is this is uh, and it's, it's kind of a confusing tale because there, he sees a vision in which a holy man promises him a new wife, which one would think is of the Christian faith. But then he it said that he also married and was a chief of the ranch. So he he actually gets an actual wife as well as he's wedded to the cause of the church, defending the Christian empire. Okay. Okay. And this is a typical sort of image of the sort of person who receives a glorious fate by fighting for a good cause. And of course, of course also bought the butler son in Lakstarsaya after avenging his father. He hasn't there isn't much to do for him in the narrative. So then he, he goes to Byzantium and becomes a Varangian and this is also a good ending for him. He has gained, gained much honor. But also there are tales of people coming back from the Varangians, and then they have increased their honor. And, and you have these examples, for example, Trapkilsaya, uh, two types of Varangians uh, who are uh, have increased their honor. One of them is with the brother of Saumur, who then becomes a legitimate prey for attack because he has such uh, uh, in gained increased honor there. Yeah. I have a question in the chat about the secular pilgrimage as kind of a Viking uh, ideology. And this is quite possible that uh, in the early Viking age, uh, some of the Vikings actually become defenders of Christian countries. So, for example, those who gained thieves in Frisia and later in Normandy. So they are kind of co-opted to the Christian cause, uh, most famously the Normans, of course, in northern France. And this is kind of similar. They are uh, they are actually exchanging their independence for a better master, you could say. Okay, I, I know that somebody else who, who couldn't join us today mentioned that they would have they would like to hear you talk a little bit, I guess, about Ibn Fadlan. Uh, do you have any thoughts to share about him? Well, yeah, it's a very interesting example because uh, uh, he comes from a very different uh, type of society. And he is very interested in the primitive nature of the Vikings. He sees them as inferior in most senses, but also kind of fascinating. So, so what he is emphasizing is their sort of rustic nature, but also their prowess in a sense. But then we have these strange uh, descriptions of the faith of the Vikings, which seems to be very pagan. There is nothing Christian there about when a servant girl, for example, is sacrificed after the death of her master and so on. So this is quite elaborate and and. Uh, Quite interesting, also because we have several Arab narrators uh, describing the Vikings, but this is way more detailed than anyone else offers. So it's kind of a unique source, and of course very well known, and very celebrated, rightly celebrated. But what's interesting, of course, that you have to read it in the context of 
the whole work of Ibn Fatlan, that he is traveling away from civilization and the Vikings are only one of many strange peoples he meets uh, on his journeys. And he is clearly looking from, a, from the vantage point of a person who regards himself as representing a higher civilization. Uh, there was, uh, you know, looking at other civilizations and one that keeps cropping up um, in this discussion um, that we've been having about the Eastern and 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 other in other ways too, the Scythians. And yeah. I know this has cropped up in my own research in Alexander Saga. And yeah. you mentioned in a note to me that perhaps those who wrote Alexander Saga felt some affinity towards the Scythians. And I've been struggling to understand what that means. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, well, Scythians are, of course, the ultimate example of the others, because they are used in that way by Herodotus, who then influences other historians and other ethno ethnographers uh, of various kinds. And in Byzantium, of course, there was this custom of using ancient uh, titles of peoples or ancient names of peoples, which is still very strong in the 11th and 12th centuries. And, and uh, although they are not completely consistent in this, but they often use old names. And uh, thus the Vikings enter if they fit somewhere, they are, for example, perhaps Scythians. And this is the case with the episode in Psellos, which has been taken to mean that, to signify the establishment of the Varantian element in the Roman army, which I think is a kind of uh, state taking it too far. But it's, it's true that uh, the Rus sent warriors to Byzantium to fight in the Roman army. And they are repre represented by Tellos as, as Tauro Scythians or Northern Scythians. So that is one of the stereotypes that could be taken or used to, to signify Vikings or, or people from the north. So okay. the other uh, outside group. Yeah. yeah. To those inside the empire or Yeah, yeah. But there are many ways of, of using this Scythian ethnic. And they are sometimes taken to mean the Turks, for example. It's basically just any people coming from the north, uh, mm. invading something from the north. But then there's that's also this. Yeah. Sorry. I was going to say that's the same ethnic group that's um, also referred to as the Peshinai, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. They are called Syrians quite often. Yeah. Interesting. And you, you did refer to the Peshinai in your article as well. Yeah, I forget, I forget the context that it was in. Oh, it was when King Yaroslav, a Prince Yaroslav of the Rus, was fighting the Petinecs. They are called Scythians, and also Atom of Bremen states that Harald was fighting Scythians. And I think yes. your admonition also mentioned the Scythians, perhaps as Bulgarians, for example. So, so the, it's it's quite frequent use of of this ethnonym. In, in Roman and Latin and Greek sources from the 11th century. Well, I think what caught my eye in Alexander's saga is that the original that it was translating from was a little bit coarser in its detail of the Scythians. Yeah. But it was, yeah, it was a more derogatory term in that, that source. Yeah, well, what I'm interested in where the Scandinavians aware that they were sometimes being likened to Scythians. I don't know. It is, okay. it is, it's interesting to explore whether they would have felt an affinity or they would have regarded them as completely alien. Or whether they're seeing themselves as the alien other yeah. as well. Yeah, they, they could do that. It, it is a possible uh, viewpoint for them. Very interesting. Um, any other thoughts from the class? Um, any thoughts from the gallery, from the Zoom gallery? Uh, there was a great uh, comment by Nicholas, a uh, great question. Any others in chat are welcome or, or in the gallery? 
Well, uh, I think uh, Atom of Bremen is a very important source because he is a contemporary source. Uh, and uh, there, uh, he has been dismissed sometimes too lightly. Uh, for example, we cannot correct Atom of Bremen by using sagas as criteria because they are much younger sources and in no way more reliable than this late 11th century source. However, of course, Atom of Bremen is also a very biased source because he's representing ecclesiastical interest and more specifically those of the Hamburg Bremen Church. So, so the, he has a tendency, for example, to, to divide kings into good kings and bad kings according to whether they are supportive of the mission from coming from Hamburg Bremen. He, and of but course, he called him a pagan. Right, but yeah, yeah. he calls sometimes he just calls bad kings pagans. Yeah, yeah, and apostates as well, sometimes. And uh, of course, he has problems with Saint Olaf, because he had been not very loyal to the Archbishopric of Hamburg Bremen, but then he had received sainthood. So, so Adam tries to sort of to make little of the fact that Olaf had not been very loyal. But then his uh, his ire is directed toward the brother of Olaf, King Harald, who is basically doing very similar thing than his brother, but uh, in a more heavy-handed manner, perhaps according to Adam. But it's clear that you know I can accept the statements of Adams as far as they go, except that there is clear, they are clearly biased. He, he takes the side of his institution. But I believe it's true that he he knew of of Harald's practices and that Harald probably rejected the supremacy of the see of Hamburg Bremen. Also, uh, Atom and the oration of admonition they 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 basically state the same facts about King Harald. They both say he is the brother of Olaf. He takes over his country, his kingdom after his brother, which is basically very similar, and also that uh, he had been in the East. So, so this is a case of two very different sources sharing the same narrative. So, for that reason, we know much more about King Harald actually than any other Scandinavian king uh, preceding him, because we have a unique situation that sources from different uh, countries are basically uh, uh, telling us the same things, sort of the same basic facts that he had been and he had fought against the Arabs and the Scythians and so on. Right. You know, the only other thing I think about with uh, the uh, Adam of Bremen accounts and why he gets sort of a, a a backlash is, you know, his his sort of ecclesiastical or, or political leanings are quite apparent, especially in his description of how Icelanders were Christianized too, right? Yeah, I mean, he's very favorable God's towards the, He's very, he, yeah, he's very favorable towards the Icelanders, of course. But then we have the problem that later Icelandic sources, especially Istnigabok, tell a different story. And that's probably due to the fact that when uh, Islingabok was composed, Iceland had Icelanders had shifted their allegiance towards the new Archbishop of Lund. So the Archbishop of Hamburg Bremen were no longer important to them. So uh, Are Thorkelson, the author of Islingabok, he doesn't really mention the Archbishop of Hamburg Bremen. And sort of, uh, he kind of insinuates that Icelanders were in direct contact to the popes. He doesn't really go as far as, as claiming that they were. He's, he just connects the bishops that they were consecrated uh, during the term of this and this pope. He doesn't really say that they were actually consecrated by the popes. But clearly his account is an attempt to sort of uh, establish a connection with the papacy. And of course, the see of Hamburg Bremen was opposed to the papacy in the investiture. Uh, conflict. So, yeah, so that's an important note to make. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, this is uh, you have to realize that the bias between these two sources is, is the opposite one. 
So, of course, it's very interesting that they they have sometimes they share the perspective. For example, East Lingaborg is not very favorable towards St. Olaf. It doesn't really, uh, the Count calls him Olaf the Stout. But uh, on in contrast, King Harald is not called Hardrada. He's just called Harald the Rex, Sigurdarsson. So there's a great respect being uh, showed towards Harald. And East Lingaborg is also the earliest source that uh, claims that Harald was king of Norway due to a direct male line. In all earlier sources, he is said to have been inherited throne because he was the brother of King Olaf. But uh, this is, there's a different perspective in East Lingaborg. And they're half brothers too, right? Yeah, according to East Lingaborg, at least. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, you got to keep that, your sources in line. That's the narrative of the later king, Sayas. Perhaps it's trying to integrate two rather conflicting accounts. But the earlier version is that Harald is the brother of King Olaf. And then the slightly later version is that he is a direct descendant of Harald Harfagra, uh, who is uh, the first king of this royal line. Yeah, and it's, well, it's interesting. Um, I know that you have spoken a little bit about whether Harald of Harfagri was a, a real entity in the same way that he's written about, and the idea that um, Harald of Harfagri may have actually wanted the epithet Harfagri himself. Yeah, I mean, that's clear that he had that epithet. It, it's yeah. stated in Anglo Saxon sources all over the place. And uh, I don't think it's a mistake, like some editors have claimed that they are mistaking him. I think, but uh, of course, it's possible that there were two kings, both known as Harfairi, but also possible that the sobriquet Harfairi is for the earlier Harald is a later invention to connect him with his descendant who, who wants to seem similar to the earlier founder of the Norwegian line. And so, be a direct descendant. Yeah, yeah, in the male line. So, so yeah. that's kind of uh, important for him, clearly. So, I think a lot of the sort of genealogies of the Norwegian kings were established by Harald and his family as a part of their state building exercise. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting take on that. Um, yeah, but. Uh, the earliest historians of Iceland, like Simon Frode and Ari Frode, they seem to like Harald a lot. <laughs> so they have a very positive view of Harald, King Harald and his family. And this becomes a theme in the sagas later, that even if there are negative depictions of Harald, it's always countered by the fact that he was very positive towards the Icelanders. Yeah, I think that's something that... Uh... Armin pointed out with Morkinskina. Yeah. Um, quite a it's bit. One the, it's one of the main themes of Morkinskina that Harald is friends with the Icelanders. But of In course, contrast to Sigurd the who's like the crazy king. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this is also this is actually quite an old theme because in in Atom of Bremen claims that his brother Olaf received support from Iceland in trying to reconquer his kingdom, and also that Harald's kind of kingdom stretched all the way to Iceland. So it's a very curious uh, way he frames this, but he clearly uh, he's clearly insinuating that these brothers have great contacts with Icelanders. So that's that's an 11th century tale. At the very least, and it's interesting in the context that um, that would have been before the the Fjordland, or so the Icelandic Commonwealth would have been ended. Yeah, you know, the, the, we we tend to believe that there were no uh, there was no relationship between Iceland and Norway, but nevertheless, the Norwegian kings, according to some narrators seem to have enjoyed some symbolic authority in Iceland, and especially St. Olaf and Harald and some of their immediate descendants. And this is, in East Lingaborg, uh, Ari is clearly trying to emphasize the connection between Norway and Iceland. 
So he's very pro a very pro Norwegian author, you could say. I think I honestly I think it's hard to deny that there were connections between the two for Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they are the issue I think is what type of connections there were, basically. And you must of course keep in mind that eleventh century Norway is not a state in the same manner as 13th century Norway, for example. The 13th right. century kings, they want taxes and so on. Uh, that's a more recent development. I don't know if 11th century kings, you know, they basically, uh, their kind of uh, tribute was that they arrived somewhere and then everybody has to pay them. You know, They cannot really place a tax on a faraway country, for example, or even a tribute. They don't have the, the capacity to do that. They don't that. have the means to do no. to that. No. So, so I would think the authority of Norwegian kings in Iceland, whatever it was, was highly symbolic. Yeah, but it starts to change in, in the end of the Commonwealth period. Yeah, yeah. With, in the 13th with, century. Yeah, with, with these magnates from Iceland going and becoming liegemen of the king and coming back, and they're supposed to act in the king's favor, but yeah. often neglect their duties. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's quite uh, kind of unclear if, if we move to that narrative, it's kind of unclear what the duties of king's retainer entailed. Some of them are clearly working on behalf of the king, some of them are not. <laughs> or some of them perform specific tasks for the king but not, are not representing here the king in general. So it's, it's a quite complicated situation. Fair enough. I think, I think we're starting to get off topic, but um, yeah. interesting nonetheless. But but... It's an interesting sidetrack, but, but um, no, I don't know what I, more I could say about the Eastern Vikings. Uh, it's, the problem is really where to begin. It's a very interesting uh, long saga of, of contacts and what, what's interesting is that the contracts are so great and of such a varied, varied nature and they really last from the 9th century up to the 13th century and even longer because for example there were still Varangians in the Roman Empire in the late medieval period although by that time they have they have there is hardly a new influx of Varangians. These are mostly descendants of, of earlier Varangians. Mm. Another thing that I sort of wanted to touch on um, that you speak about in the article um, related to that connection to Byzantine or the East in general yeah. is are the Swedish rune stones. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the people that left. They, are, the they are really the earliest Scandinavian sources for these connections. Connections and, and as you know, uh, there is an increase in runestone inscriptions in the 11th century, and it has been there has been a study made of of what countries are mentioned in the runestones, and it's interesting that Greenland is one of the countries that's most often mentioned. And uh, in the article, I I relate this to. Uh, Latin practices, but this can also be related to Slavonic practices because they also use this term, Grecia, for, for the Roman Empire. So, so, but it's it's clearly not directly from the Varangians who would have called them Romans rather than Greeks. Right, and then this idea of them being a, a Greek state. Was it, that wasn't really their own idea, was it, either? No, no. They would have looked, regarded themselves as Roman. As well. <laughs> and the kind of Hellenist movement in Byzantium from the 12th century, that's more to do with culture and religion. That's to say they have this cultural identity going back to ancient Greece. Yeah. Um... It's, it's, it's also interesting to note that the main themes on the runestones are the wealth of Byzantium and there, there's also these narratives of people who died there that's to say uh, so it's, it's basically the same themes 
are similar to her family sagas. People come from there with great wealth, and some of people go there to meet uh, a glorious end, you could say. But there are accounts of people coming back too, but probably That's not what... as many. Probably not as many, though, I guess. Well, there is, we have no means of, of doing quantitative research into this, but yeah. these, are the, these are the main topics. People went to Greece and died there, and they were. They did enough to be commemorated on a runestone, which is which is quite an achievement. But also, there are some mention of of great wealth coming from there. So, and so the other early source is the skaldic poetry that you point to. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a more problematic source because it's not written down until the 13th centuries. But people have a tendency to believe that at least the 11th century poetry is very ancient and maybe contemporary. Uh, and there are also themes there, which are very similar to the themes in the runestones and in the sagas. The wealth is another theme, but also sort of glory and honor to be gained from going to Constantinople. And, and of course, again, sorry. Of course, there's also the narrative of, of King Harald blinding the king and the emperor which is very curious and became a, a part of the narrative tradition concerning Harald already in the late 12th century, but not in the earlier sources. And as we know, uh, a Byzantine emperor was planted in 1042, and people, Silphus Blantal, was sort of debating whether this could be a true story and Harald had actually done the deed, which I think is a bit optimistic. But uh, especially since it's not mentioned in the earliest sources, but then perhaps this became quite early on part of the legend of Harald. That's really interesting. Um, so the skaldic poetry, while not reliable, is an oral tradition that has some basis in fact, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, and and it's you know, even if it may not be. It was subject to change. They probably have an ancient background, at least. And I think it's interesting to relate this to what you're talking about with Greta Saga as an, a living oral tradition at, a to yeah. at that time, that it was almost almost contemporaneous to it yeah. being, written, being written. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think uh, there are some aspects of the Harald narrative that, that are apparent, that are there already in the 11th century. And then there are some additions as well. You know, uh, no 11th century source, for example, mentions the dungeon and fighting a lion or a dragon there. That's a later addition. And also some of the tricks that are associated with Harald's campaign, which have been identified as folk tales by, by Jan de Vries and other scholars. And uh, those are... You could say there is a Harald cycle that can absorb new materials or new elements. That's great. But the prevailing view of Harald in the 13th century tradition, the saga tradition, is that he is a different type. He's not a heroic king. He is more of an anti-hero or a trickster even. And this is the image of Harald that's that becomes part of the saga tradition and is very yeah. noticeable in Greta saga, for example. That, that is really interesting and, and sort of maybe a, a sentence or phrase that you had in your article really got me thinking about Loki and Lokasena. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because there was this, you know, position of his where he, he would uh, point out people's adultery or, or misbehavior or something. I can't remember what it was exactly, but... It, it seemed very reminiscent of a locus Yeah, yeah, and, and it's true. He Harald sort of assists Thorsten Dromundur in, in some deceit that's nevertheless for a good course, or at least the course of, of getting his lady. But uh, it's it's kind of, it's not like a noble Christian king would do. So you can say that... Uh, to Olaf, for example, in the side region, uh, Olaf Trikosan and Saint Olaf, they are like Tolkien heroes. 
but Harald is more like a George Martin character. <laughs> more realistic. Yeah, I'm actually playing the Game of Thrones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and, and of course, uh, this is more believable in a sense. So Harald becomes a very sort of a character we can identify with in a sense. And uh, in later novels, for example, he's a very popular Norwegian king. Much more so than the two Olafs who have these very traditional saintly qualities. Right, yeah. Well, the two Olafs, the first one being Olaf Tryggvason. Olaf Tryggvason, who is, who is uh, despite his uh, the criticism of Atom of Bremen, Icelanders saw him as, as a very heroic king all the time, all, from East Lindingabok and then onwards, and then Saint Olaf, who is also uh, usually portrayed sometimes as a tragic king, but always as a good, very good Christian king. It's interesting to note uh, Haldor Laxness' view of, of St. Olaf uh, in Wayward Heroes or Gertla. Yeah, he's he's trying to deconstruct the Olaf myth, I would say. Yeah. And yeah, this it really is, feels like that. Yeah, and this is, of course, uh, in modern literature, has been done to more of these heroic Norwegian King, but you can't do that with Harald uh, Hardrad because this has already been done in the medieval texts. So he is already quite, you know, uh, quite the anti hero, I would say. Uh, on one more little chat comment from Dustin. I was kind of hoping he would comment with the Loki uh, idea. Um, yeah. Deceit, deceit for a good cause, fascinating stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's an ambiguous portrayal because Thorsten Dromundur and Spes, they, they engineer this deception and turns out the King Harald was helping them all along. And then they repent in old age. And, you know, the, the saga takes uh, a stand that this was perhaps not very good. But nevertheless, this is the foundation of their happiness and their marriage. Anyway, so so it's kind of and and Thorsti Dromund has an ambiguous uh, relationship with King Harald in the narrative. He goes back to Norway uh, under King Magnus, but when Harald comes back, he doesn't want to be a retainer anymore. Nevertheless, Harald had assisted him in Constantinople, according to the side. So Harald is this, you know, quite scary character, sort of a helper for a good cause, but nevertheless a, a very sort of uh, dangerous helper, you could say. Which, yeah, it works for Loki as well. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this, has, this has important parallels with the Loki uh, picture, uh, figure, yeah. For sure. That's great. Um, the only other thing I was thinking of was um, the epithet for Thorstein Thrones. Yeah, yeah. Named after the ship, Dromon. Dromon. Yeah. the Greek yeah. word Dromon for ship, and, and you 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 have the word Dromonter in the other meaning in some sagas as a ship, like um, a okay. ship, Mediterranean ship. So it's it's clear. I think in this instance, it's clear what the nickname means, and this must be connected to his uh, travels in the east. It has to be connected to his travels. In the East, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, the talk that Neil Price gave in Iceland last yep. fall. I think it was. Yep. And in he October, yeah. pointed out this sh this type of ship. I think. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. And we were kind of looking at that, and I, you know, I had no idea that. So Icelanders in say the 13th century would have known what a that kind of ship was. Well, at least the saga writers have yeah. the knowledge to mention this type of ship. So I think, yeah, it's, it's not a, not not a common word. word. So, so they would perhaps know about this, you know, typical Mediterranean uh, medieval galley, really. It replaces the galleys in the medieval time. Right, but then there's an Italian version that comes after it, you say in the article, that, that it was replaced by an Italian. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That that so it, 
the term dromon really refers to the high medieval ships, Mediterranean ships. Oh, okay. So, so it's not part of the age of uh, you know expansion in the 15th century, for example. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fair. Um, does anybody else have any questions, comments? I think we've had a good run. We've had you for about an hour now. Yeah. Um, so if, if I can pull any more comments or questions out of anybody, that'd be great. But otherwise, we can... Well, I, I can show the books on Eastern Vikings since I'm on camera. So these are really the books that are the result of our project. Is it? Uh, I think I see it as a mirror. Do you see it uh, correctly? Yes, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I have that sitting right here too. <laughs> and, then, and then there's that one that's just recently appeared. So this is a monograph, and this is a collection of articles. Okay, I don't These know are, if we have that one. No, no. I mean, uh, you, you will probably. <laughs> I, I, you will probably get them at the library at least at, at some point. They're sort of quite well-known publishers. Well, I'm trying to write them down so that I can order them for the library. Yeah, okay. But you, you have them up so fast. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We have that one. I have, yeah. Okay. Great, thank we you. So this is the more recent one. The making of the Eastern Vikings. Thank you. Yeah, this only appeared in, in February, so and uh, sort of this includes a lot of the results of our research project. Articles okay. by most of the people involved and so on. And Neil Price has another project going on himself too. That yeah, well very interesting. Yeah, this is uh, works by historians and literary scholars. And very little archaeology there. We had right. an archaeologist, but he he wrote about the textual <laughs> sources as well. <laughs> Pyotr Andrzejuk from Ukraine. And okay. even if he's a respected archaeologist, he decided to write his article on a more literary theme. So so uh, I think the project by New Place will also add some further value to the this uh, topic. Great. Um, but his uh, Neil Price's project, though, I'm, I'm just I don't know if I understand its scope because it's so broad. It's very broad. It's it's not really just the Rus and the Varangian, but it's the Eastern general also, all going all the way to China. So it's it's much broader in scope. Well, he, yeah, he's always trying to push further and further east. It seems. Yeah. Yeah. But he has been following the project and, and uh, is an associate member of it, so I'm sure he knows about what we have done so far. Yeah, so yeah, I was just hoping you guys were collaborating a bit. We are collaborating a bit, but but uh, sort of it's kind of two different types of sources we're utilizing. You know, we of are course, not, yeah. not much using the archaeological evidence, but of course. We are creating a context in which that can be re-evaluated, perhaps. That's great. Okay, yeah. No other questions or comments? Last chance? Armin and, and, and Andy uh, say thank you, and I would like to thank you as well. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence and, and just you. telling us about your ideas on this topic. It's awesome. Yeah, really yeah. Thank you. I had fun. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thanks for today. Likewise. Yeah.